take a journey with us into a world that few understand and even fewer dare to go. I'm your host, and ever before you. Welcome, everybody, to Into the Unknown Realm. I am Naomi. Woo-wee! And I'm Steve. <laughs> and I'm Carrie. And I'm Brian. We are so excited today because we have a really interesting lady with can us. You, can you tell that I'm excited? <laughs> <laughs> Sharon is the Sharon Coyle Farley is the owner of Rolling Hills Asylum. One of the most coolest places in the world. This place is, I believe, about 52,000 square feet of asylum, (laughs) Rolling Hills Asylum. And it has been named the second most haunted place in the United States. Fourth in the world. Which is amazing. And... um, we are actually excited because uh, Sharon is actually a native of our area, which is New Hampshire. And uh, we just want to welcome Sharon to the show. Back to New England, Sharon. How are you doing? Hi. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> You're welcome. We're excited. <laughs> <laughs> How are so, the uh, up there? I bet you they're gorgeous. They are. They are totally gorgeous. They're, they're totally beautiful. Cool. Yeah, definitely prime time right now. And, of course, all we need is one good storm to blow them all away. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Everything turns white. You know that up here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's a five-letter word I don't talk about. Oh, me too. I absolutely hate the snow. Of course, you just, you came back from California, right? Yeah, I did. I lived up there for quite a long time, many, many years. And before that it was New Hampshire here with us. Yeah. Now was right? it Port was it Portsmouth? No, it's Nashville. Actually I worked in Portsmouth when I worked in the film business. I worked for a film production company up there, showing Tracy Associates and another one called Whitewater Productions. Um, and then I moved to California. But I I grew up in Gary in Manch Vega. Man Manchester. Uh-huh. Manch Vega. <laughs> yeah, the, awesome. the locals called it Nash Manch Vega. I actually used to work in Bedford Which of course is right next to Manchester It was quite a drive for me It was about, I don't know, about an hour You know, if there was no accident But I I was working on it Yeah, you guys didn't have that new highway now, right? I hear there's a new highway going like to Hampton and stuff Which cuts out a lot of traffic Oh, 101, yeah Yeah Yep, straight shot. If you're really tired, it's not a good road. <laughs> no, it's very hypnotic. You could fall asleep really, really quickly. So, Sharon, a lot of people in the world don't wake up one day and think, I'm going to go buy a very haunted asylum today. <laughs> what made you want to buy Rolling Hills Asylum? Well, I didn't wake up thinking that either. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I actually, it's it's so weird. People try to ask me that all the time. I just had a conversation earlier today with somebody, and it wasn't it wasn't that I woke up. I'm like, I'm gonna go shopping. I'm gonna go look online and see what's for sale. It, it didn't happen like that. Um, mm-hmm. I actually got. I had been out here in 2008, um, just on a regular ghost hunt with Dave Trader, Darkness Radio. I kind of blame Dave for this. Ha ha. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean that in a nice way. But Dave, um, Dave Schrader and uh, Jason Grant, they had an event out here. And I had, you know, three incredible, incredible days of activity and nights of activity. And didn't think I'd ever come back to western New York um, at all. I was happy in the beach life and the weather. But I got a call in the spring of 09 that the place was closing down. And it was like a light switch went off. I just literally had a meltdown about it. And there was no rhyme or reason or logical thinking behind it. It made no sense. But uh, it was such an overwhelming drive to have to have this place. Uh, there's no, I can't even put it into words. It really makes no sense. I mean, it makes no sense. But I had to have it. It was yours. It was your baby, huh? Yeah, but I mean, it really, I mean, honestly, it made no sense. 
Like, it was just a complete drive to have to have this place. And, and it was to say, you know, not only a haunted location, but a very historical location. Somebody wanted you to have that place. Yeah, something from there called you into it. Now, do you, do you think it was yeah. more of a pull for the paranormal side of things or for the historical side of it? It was both. I think the pull, I think the actual, I think they actually, <laughs> it's going to sound weird. Um, I think that the spirits actually, when I came here in 2008, I, for whatever reason, whatever reason it was, I think they, they had already made up their mind that they wanted me there. And I know it sounds really far-fetched. But I think that they knew because it, it was just, it made no sense. I mean, I literally bought it the day before my birthday. It went up for sale, and then there was a long period of time over the course of the summer where I kept, you know, I looked at it a couple of different times, and then it ended up going up in uh, a different avenue for sale, and I got it literally the day before my birthday. Wow. And I, think I really do. Yeah, it's kind of weird. October 25th, and my birthday is the 26th, so. Kind of well, happy pre-birthday. <laughs> yeah, that's Thank you. So how many um, years did you I'm just going to say I have no more birthday gifts coming to me from now until I die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's quite yeah. the whopper of a birthday present. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, do you so, usually bring the birthday cake into the asylum and have them help you blow it out? <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, my volunteers are always, you know, they're starting to, to hammer me. It's, it's getting to be about that time, and they're like, so when's your birthday again? And they know what it is. And they're like, <laughs> I know that they're planning something. I'm like, no, I'm not having any more. We're going backwards. There's no more birthdays here. So. <laughs> That's funny. Now, Terry, you had a question? How many years have you owned this now? Um, I bought it in October 2009. Nine. So four years. Wow. That's, that's very cool. Now, I know when we were there, you told us so much great history information on the place, but I would love it if you could share that for our listeners um, about Rolling Hills. Well, it's really interesting because the, the, the name is kind of a misnomer. It really doesn't go with the property at all. Um, it was actually the Genesee County Poorhouse in Poor Farm, and it opened up in 1827, and it literally stayed a poor house and a poor farm for well over 110 10 years or so. Um, it housed everyone. It was really kind of like a a, a one-stop, I don't want to say dumping ground, but it was really for all the cast of in society. Everyone that was from paupers to the mental and physically disabled and Civil War veterans and Native Americans and widows and orphans. It just housed everyone. It was literally a self-sustained community. They farmed out here. They grew all their own, you know, fruits and vegetables and had their own cattle and everything. They just did everything here. Um, and then in 1938, they built the Genesee County Infirmary, which was, is the brick building with the cupola that everyone knows is Rolling Hills. And then in 58, one of the dorms burnt down, so they they built the well, say fifty six fifty seven. And they built the long east wing in fifty eight, which ended up housing the men's um the men's dorm for a long time. And then in nineteen sixty four it got converted to the Genesee County nursing home. And then they closed it down as a nursing home in seventy four and it sat empty for ten years and then it had three private owners private to me prior to me, all lasting ten wow. years. So wow. uh, but I mean as far as asylum goes the previous owner had called it, um, had used Rolling Hills for their mall. They had a craft mall and antique mall. And then when they started doing the paranormal, they incorporated that name um, in, into the new name. And then I just went with it because it was already known as Rolling Hills. Wow. Gotcha. Cool. It, and it is 52,000 square feet, correct? 54, but who's counting? Oh, oh. <laughs> We must, have, a little. we must have missed those other 2,000 okay. square feet that night we were walking through it. I'll tell you what, um, just for our listeners, this place was massive. There were hallways. I don't even know how I got to them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, matter of fact, we actually walked down one hallway 
And um, we went on all the way to the end of it, and there was a, a huge glass atrium area, which was beautiful to look out. Um, but me and Naomi were actually walking back, and we saw a, a full-bodied shadow, is basically the best way I can describe it, walk from our right-hand side to our left-hand side across the double doors of the atrium area. Um, just impressive. I love that place. <laughs> and what was funny was, like, he saw it and, like, looked, and he didn't say anything to me. I was just going and to be quiet. Like, did you see that? And he's like, yeah, full body apparition, <laughs> walk across. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. But like I said, I don't yeah. even know how I got to that hallway. Yeah. It's well, like, really funny because a couple of my volunteers, uh, well, actually one of my volunteers, Cody, uh, was in the, the, uh, the kitchen the other night. It was late, late, late. And his brother was with him. And he's been here, I don't know, a year and a half, two years now, probably close to two years now. And he's never really seen any of the shadow people himself. Some people, it takes a while for them to see them. Other people see them immediately. But he was saying, geez, I really wish I could see, you know, like, you know, maybe tonight will be the night I probably see a shadow person. And he just shut his mouth. Now, he's standing in the kitchen, like in back and towards where all the equipment used to have been, you know, used to be all where all the stainless steel was in. Yep. And he's facing, the, he's facing the wall, the cement wall, the cinder block wall. And as he's standing there, he, you know, he's talking to his brother, who's kind of looking over his right shoulder, you know, at an angle for his brother. And he just stopped in mid-sentence because coming on the other side of his brother, headed towards the wall, was a solid, not even a shadow, a full-body apparition that walked across the kitchen and right through the wall. And it wasn't sure. he didn't even use the door. I mean, it was right through the wall, and he just didn't even know what to say. <laughs> he was just like, no. <laughs> And he had, like, literally two years, and he just shut his mouth. They were like, okay, he wants to know, I'll show you something now. So it was really (laughs) funny. It was, like, dumbfounded. Wow. I mean, the personal experiences that me and Naomi walked away from that night were, I mean, incredible. Uh, Some of the best ones that I've ever had. I I mean, I just can't explain. I mean, we had footsteps above us that were literally on the roof. Um, We would have swore there was a third floor um, of where we were. That full-bodied shadow, um, we've had that. That uh, whole suit that was spinning around in a circle that <laughs> um, that oh, seems unexplainable. Morgue. Yeah. Yeah. Or should we call it the bakery? <laughs> um, actually, yeah, really. It's so funny you want... people, you know, you know, I know how people look at me on the tour. You know, I tell them these things are going to happen, and they're like, you know, in the beginning they're kind of like, okay, this is cool, and then I start talking, telling them all the things, and I know, like, they're looking at me saying, yeah, all right, now she's going a little overboard here. Until you go out on your own, and then you see it actually happen. Right, so exactly. Cool. And can you explain the whole thing behind the suit in the morgue to our listeners? Yeah, um, this is the first year, of the first October, that we have not done a theatrical haunted house. The first three years I did a, like a theatrical haunted house with actors and smoke and fog and the whole nine yards. And a couple of years ago, I picked up a, a suit, a piece of milled it together of goodwill to hang in the morgue for the set dressing. And uh, I took the suit and, you know, the suit and the pants and the jacket and the tie and the shirt. And after Halloween, I was like, you know what, if they're prepping a body, there would have been a suit here. And I kind of like the creep back that kind of just hangs up there. And when you walk by, it's kind of like eerie to see that, you know, in the shadows. So I thought, okay, I'll just leave it up. They're good at atmosphere. Well, the spirits that go down there have discovered that they like to use it as a pendulum. It's just hanging by a regular wooden coat hanger and with a little, you know, the metal clock on the coat hanger, and then it's got a little piece of monofilament, which is fishing line, and there's a picture hook on this little small beam that's hanging out. It was there. The picture hook was there for, like, I don't know how long. It's been there. I didn't hang it up. I just hung the suit on it. And there's no draft in the kitchen at all because on the windows they actually have plastic dollar store black table cloth that I cut up into curtains hanging on the window so if there was any wind for me it would flutter you know it's really that light and there's no air circulation but the spirits will go down there and use the suit as a pendulum so you can ask it to spin with the tie facing one direction for yes and the other for no um, you can ask it to follow you around and it will spin around with the tie facing like it's watching you and mm-hmm. when it, they're all done communicating with you it will spin around with the back of the suitcase and you're like okay I'm done you can talk <laughs> now, just to to explain what happened to me down there, I I was already skeptical of this. So, of course, when I went down, I was like, okay, 
you know, if, if, if you can face me, that would be great. And it kept turning its back to me the whole time. But any time Naomi would speak, it would face her. Yeah. No matter which way we were in the room. But it would never face me. And he's like, oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. <laughs> and he's like, if you can really hear me, just spin all the way around. Spin right? around in a circle. And it's funny. It, it didn't do it. It just kind of turned a little. And then all of a sudden, like, our K2 meters and stuff start going off like crazy. And they're on the table in the middle of the room. And so we try to debunk it, thinking there's got to be some kind of electrical current or something setting it off, you know. So we're literally looking at the table. Yeah. We're like looking at the table, looking all around, looking for things plugged in, looking at the um, fridges and everything that are down there. They're not plugged in. There's, you know, we are trying our hardest to debunk, and we turn around, <laughs> and the, the suit's spinning around. Completely in a around. circle. <laughs> like someone had just grabbed it and, it and turned it. Yeah. Whoa. And it was going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty cool. I, I mean, people, they have no explanation. I know you get these. Yeah, you guys can best your like yourself. They come in like, oh, we're going to debunk this. And I'm like, yep, okay, go ahead, go for it. Try it. <laughs> I, I, I tried. <laughs> I know. And it, it's just awesome. It really is awesome. The, the sad part is, I well, sad for me, I don't I don't know who does it. I think there are multiple, I think multiple people use it as a communication tool. I really do. I just don't know who they are. They don't always tell us their names, obviously. And then we have the guy down there that actually speaks full on Italian. Oh, yeah. Pronunciation. Yeah. With, so, there was a story we were told. Someone was speaking to him in Italian. Yeah. I can't yeah, remember yeah. who that was. I want to say it was Bob Christopher, wasn't it? I, uh, actually, it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a bittersweet story for me to tell. Um, <clears throat> one of my volunteers was a federal marshal, uh, Jason Jewett, and he actually filmed the ghost detective show with us. And he was there at Paraclyph, and literally a week later, he got in a car accident and died. Oh. Yeah, that was a very, very sad. Yeah, it was actually Jason who was speaking Italian and getting him uh. to correct the pronunciation. So, yeah, oh, it was, it was you that told us the story. That's right. Yeah. We're uh, we're oh. definitely sorry for your loss. Yeah, there. I know you took that really, really hard. I felt just so bad. I just. And what's kind of ironic is um, the, the the day, morning. the morning that we were going to go drive over to Rolling Hills for the um, the Paraquest. Um, I actually got a call that a good friend of mine had passed away in a motorcycle accident. Just like um, hours before yeah. within the night. And uh, that, that was so weird that, you know, here we Jason as well out. passed away. And I don't know. Yeah. That was a week later. He got he, he was at Paraclast on um I want to say he was there on Saturday and Sunday and then uh the following Friday. Yeah, it's horrible. It's like people just don't like you now, you know, in the instant they're there and the instant they're gone. It's really unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, you never ever know. I mean, it's just it's crazy world and you just gotta definitely enjoy every single moment that you have with people. That's for sure, and we're really sorry that you lost your friend. That that's that's very sad, and obviously a, a staple within Rolling Hills as well. I appreciate but, that. We all took it really, really hard. He's a great guy, thirty years old. And actually, uh, our listeners, if um, I, I believe on your website, you actually have a picture of you and him and someone else. Um, on your yeah, website. Yeah, that's my other volunteer, uh, Julie. So we were all pretty good friends. I mean, all of us. I mean, there were more more of us that were all connected. Um, right. That's just what, what's really nice about my crew is that they really are friends outside of here. You know, it's really, really nice. Oh, yeah. You know what? All of our, like, our para friends that um, have been to your place, they always talk so sweet about you and always say, oh, Sharon's the greatest. She's so sweet. She's Aww. the lowest, that. And I've never had heard anybody say one bad thing about you. <laughs> oh, that's nice to know. Thank you. You're welcome. And I want you to know, we still remember that you want um, those clam bellies. Full bellied clams. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always tell people from New England, I can't help it. It's terrible. It's really weird how you just get something in your head growing up that you like and you just can't get it out of it, you know. Mind your home. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
So, um, Sharon, who are some of the spirits at Rolling Hills that you know of, like by by names? And can you tell us anything um, that you may know about them, like the history? or Because I know that you told us um, when you go in there in the morning, you always say hello to everybody, all the spirits. and well, Mostly like you're, they're your children. Yeah. I do. I was putting, again, I was just talking to somebody earlier today and, and said the same thing to them, that, you know, every day I go in there and it's, hi, how are you? And, you know, is the weather great? Or, you know, this is what's going on. And, oh, someone else can be in to, you know, do some work around the property or blah, 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 blah. And then we had a teen hunt going in. So, hey, we're having a teen hunt. You know, they're coming with the parents, so go easy on them, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and then at the end of the night, I always, Literally, every I walk down the hallway on the way to the door, and I'm like, I love you. Thank you so much for coming out and, and interacting with everyone. I know that, you know, sometimes you might not feel like it, so I do appreciate it. And, you know, and this is what's going on. I'll be in tomorrow, or I won't be in tomorrow, or I'll be doing this tomorrow, or whatever. I just constantly always talk to them. I mean, they're there. Why should I just talk to them when I'm trying to do an ABT yeah. session? That's just rude. Yeah. That's like, you know, only using them when I want to use them. They're there all the time. I have them all the time. They're my family. Now, do you think you started that because of out of trying to be comfortable being in there alone with them or just because you truly just love them and, and all the spirits in the environment? No, no. I just did it because I, what I just said, I really believe that, you know, if we're going to talk to them, we shouldn't just talk to them when it's convenient for us. Right, That's yeah. Really That's like, yeah. you know. You might not always feel like talking to a friend of yours. You might be going through something. But, hey, hit them up on Facebook. Send them a little text once in a while, even if it's just a smiling face, so you know that they know that you're thinking of them and you right. haven't just, you know, forgot about them totally. Don't just call them when you're having troubles and don't just call them if you're having something wonderful happen. Just have to connect with people all the time. Right. Because they expect are a, people. I'll expect a smiley face tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, see. Sorry. <laughs> this yeah. is a little bit of the craziness of the show. <laughs> Although I have to tell you, starting Thursday, I'm working like 24 days straight without a day off. Oh, my um, God. And like 18, 20 hour days. So, honestly, you have to bear with me. It, it might be 26 days before you get that smiley face. <laughs> I might forget. At least I know it's coming. So. <laughs> well, it's just the it's season, like, right? It's pretty crazy. <laughs> But when yeah. I told him, my volunteer said yesterday, because I was, like, trying to say something. I couldn't remember what the heck I was going to say. And he goes, I'm going to make you a shirt saying, my name is Sharon, but you can't remember your own name. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so there, there's um, some spirits there. Like, we know there's a little girl named Joy. That, um, Actually, Elizabeth. I know Elizabeth. Elis- I don't know Joy. Elizabeth. Oh, that's funny. I could have swore you were saying Joy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we actually wanted to said Joy. Huh? Did you get Did you get an EVP that said Joy? I want to say we were in the Christmas room, and John Tobin told us about a little girl named Joy. Yeah, she was doing the flashlight in the hide and go seek. I could have swore he said yeah, Joy. Yeah, I could have swore as Maybe well. Maybe that's somebody that he got. Maybe that's somebody that he got. I don't know. Oh, very true. Very true. And then there was uh, someone else who said that name. So is it Elizabeth that goes um, that's seen in Shadow Hallway a lot? Elizabeth is down in the chapel a lot. Um, she actually goes around different areas, and that's another thing. A lot of people think that spirits only stay in one room. They don't. They go everywhere in the building. I mean, we when we go on the tour, we'll tell you where we see or hear or interact with them the most, but they do go around. She's been upstairs. She's been in the doll room. She goes everywhere. But, I mean, we when we talk about her on the tours, we talk about her in the chapels. That's where people mostly find her, is in the chapels. We actually had um, a... Like I, Go ahead. I was going to say, like I said, though, um, it's not the wrong possibility that John got somebody named Joy. There are a lot, you know, there's 300 years of history there, which equates to 300 years of people dying on, on this property. Right. And so we only have 1,700 documented deaths, and probably on our right... Uh, that was awful. A regular roster of spirits, I'll say. Um, there's probably about 20, 25 that we know that interact with us on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean that's all that's there. We get a lot of 
interactions from spirits, but they don't tell us their name, or other people get different names than we do. I mean, you know, there's just so many people there. I know, and so much square footage. It's just amazing. It, what amazed me is we drove up, it looks so much smaller from the front than it really is. Yep. And, yeah. you know, we drove around back, and, you know, you could tell it was definitely bigger. But when you're inside, it's massive. It's just like, <laughs> okay, where did we come from? Which re- does yeah. now this goes to no. I only knew where I was in that building one time, and that's when Naomi said, "Do you hear those footsteps above us?" And clearly, you could hear them. I was just taking pictures of Naomi walking around the room, and I said, "There's no floor above us. It's the roof." And she said, I'm like, "No, there's a third yeah. floor." And I had to actually bring her up to the door and have her look through the the uh, the window to the outside of the uh-huh. the roof. And yeah, she was yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> and you could hear so many, I mean, Kinda a like lot 20 people of footsteps above us. Yeah. And it it was locked. It was locked to go up <laughs> to the roof. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no and, way to get up there except for that locked door. It's really yep. locked. So, yeah. Yep. No, there's no way up there. Um, I, was, I mean, if, I, if she had said she'd heard footsteps, I'd been like, no way. But I actually heard them, with, you know, myself. And I was like, there's no way. That's the roof. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It used to be a four-story wooden dormitory there, and now we only have a three-story building. There used to be another floor there. Really? Oh, really? Yeah, it was a four-story oh. men's dorm that burned down. Um, yeah. And then they built a line thing over it. So that's why. That makes sense. That does make a lot yep. of sense now. <laughs> so they think it's still there. But still there. Yeah, absolutely. As far as they're concerned, it's like still there. Wow. That's cool. So, Sharon, do you have, like, um, a story or two about the place of experiences that either you yourself experienced or other people that have been there have experienced that you would like to share with us and our listeners? You don't have enough hours in the day for me to tell you everything. Um, <laughs> no, not everything, but, like, some oh, yeah. like special ones you'd like one to share. The, one of the most incredible ones it was a very private experience, and it happened – uh, with two of my, my two volunteers, Amy and Scott, and one of their friends, um, Mike and myself. And it was two years ago on the anniversary of the passing of Roy, our seven and a half foot shadow man, who is my personal favorite um, spirit there. And it was April, April 11th, and it was two years ago. And we were all, the four of us, we were the only ones in the building, the only ones in the building. And we were sitting down in Shadow Hallway, and we were, you know, trying to talk to Roy. And um, I had just located his headstone over in a cemetery over in Batavia, in one of the Potter's Fields, where there's only four kind of actual stones. But the people who are buried there are 10 to 14 deep. Roy isn't. Roy has his own plot because his father um, actually had some money. And even though he abandoned them at the poorhouse, um, the family did give him a headstone. So, anyways, I told him I just found his headstone and da 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 da. And oh, I wanted to plant some roses out there. And so, all of a sudden, you could just smell. And, and I smelled, I didn't say anything. And all of a sudden, Scott goes, Do you smell that? The only way to describe it is it smelled like the most incredible, long stem American Beauty red roses, like if you got it from a, like a, a very expensive floral shop in New York City where you spend, spend like, I don't know, $300 on a dozen of roses, or if you walked into a funeral home that was loaded with just roses or florists yeah. with just roses, it was that fresh rose scent, and it wasn't mm-hmm. perfume. It, you know, you know the difference between rose perfume, which is, which is kind of nauseating. This was mm. fresh, cut, beautiful roses, and it lasted probably 15 minutes and we all smelled it and we all and to this day we still talk about it like oh i wish we could have smell a vision or to a bottle that smells because we could smell it it was pretty amazing wow. that was like the most beautiful haunting event that happened i love that that was the most special thing to me i mean it's so it's nothing tangible as long as you think a shadow person or you're an apparition but that there was just so incredible um mm. To this day, we still talk about it, and we really do. Wow. That's awesome. That's very awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. <laughs> and, then, and then just Saturday night, um, it was so funny because I don't get out. 
<laughs> sounds really awful. I don't get out to investigate my own building very often because I'm just so busy. And, you know, when I'm, if I do the tours, I do the tours. And then I'm usually in the green room because I've got to help people when they want to come in and do this, that, and the other thing. I'm putting a drink or whatever. But I had some um, volunteers that hadn't been out in a while. So we went out to test some equipment in the hallway. I was only out there maybe 20 minutes, shadow hallway. And I came back in, and we were all in the green room while people were out investigating in the hall and, you know, in the building. And everyone was sitting, you know, where I stand at the counter, everyone was sitting to my left in the sofa. Dorothy was behind me, uh, clutching around in his case, and there was no one to the right of me at all. Everyone was gone. There was nobody in, like, the booth or anything else. And the door was closed. There was nobody there. And I was kind of turned to these people in the sofa, and all of a sudden I... I heard out loud, Sharon, and I looked, and I knew who it was. But I looked at Darcy and I said, "You didn't say anything, did you?" He goes, "No, I heard it too." And a few of the other um, people that were in the room, saying the sofa chair too. It was Roy who had come in, and he actually called my name out loud, and uh, he has a very distinctive voice. So that was kind of cool. I every time wow. I hear him say my name or talk to me, I don't think Elton John fan. You'd think Elton John figure walked in the room. <laughs> because I get so excited. Oh, Dorothy, say hi to me, you know? <laughs> Four years later, I'm still like, I'm like a little school girl around. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 I'm a little school girl. Now, that, that wasn't Roy, was it? <laughs> oh, no. That's, that's my little killer over here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that. He's glaring at me because I called him killer. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's too smart for his own good. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just like things like that. It's uh, doors opening and closing in front of us. What's really cool is Cecil will slam doors. I'll be on tours, and we'll be in the you know the museum room just starting a tour. No one's around in the building. We're all together, including my volunteers, my backup, and you'll hear the big metal doors being slammed up in the infirmary. And everyone's like, whoa, what is that? I'm like, Cecil slam on the door. Cecil, can he do it again? Bam. And then we get up there. None of the doors are closed. It shouldn't be closed. And none of the doors are open. It shouldn't be open. Everything is just the way it should be. But you hear these doors slamming. It's crazy. Ah, I love that. It's it's actually pretty funny. Like, I, um, when we were there for the ParaQuest, we, uh, me and Naomi, and Denny ended up um, walking around the building so we could get some pictures of me and Naomi at the front of the building and, um, you know, where the doors are. And I'm a, I'm a window looker, so I like to look up in the windows and see if I can see people standing in them or, or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. There's one window to, if you're looking at the door to the right, I want to say it's the second window on the second floor. There's a crib in it? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh-huh. I, I I actually saw what I thought was somebody standing in it. When I looked at them, they moved to my right, so it would have been to their left inside the window to, like, disappear. Nice. Well, what was funny is later in the night, um, it was our last stop with the uh, the celebrities, and we were sort of given free reign to, to just go down the hallways and do whatever. And me and Naomi walked into this room, and as soon as we walked in, we realized it was the room that I saw the thing move in. And standing in the window was a little doll in the crib and that's what i saw move <laughs> oh you actually um, saw it move though i i did i saw it move from like it was center of the window and it moved out of view to my right and wow. when it got and up that thing is heavy that's not a light one either it's pretty yeah. heavy i mean but, in in the scheme of things it doesn't weigh like 100 pounds but it's not right. like an easy thing to move when we got up there though the doll was dead center of the window again so oh, i don't I can't really explain it. But. <laughs> we were actually in the barber shop with Bob Christopher, um, just the three of us, and um, doing live EVPs. Yeah, doing live EVPs, and and Steve was in the barber shop chair, and it's being the guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, being the bait, <laughs> and we actually got an EVP of shears, like the old metal shears, like. The- like- you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, well, Steve was listening live on his recorder. I didn't hear it. Right. Uh, right. But, uh, but he heard it, and they were talking about giving him, you know, a cut or whatever. Okay. And he actually um, said he had the feeling like hair dropping in front of his face. You know that. The cobwebby feeling. feel, but yeah. it, it almost yeah. would be like you get fresh haircut, and the hair falls in front of your face. Um, 
I didn't lose any hair that night. I mean, I don't have much to lose anyways, but um, it was definitely a neat experience. I actually have a Funny, question. When we, were filming, when we were filming the ghost detector show with them, um, Dave, I think it was Dave, that was walking around with a tray of some Turner objects and stuff throughout the whole night, like a little tray and some other equipment on it. And had no, you know, just carrying it around. We were stopping in every room, and if we used something, we might not use them. And as he was walking into the barber shop, he was ahead of me, and literally he put one foot into the barber shop, and the only thing, and this tray has a lip around it, so things don't, you know, slide off. It was like somebody hit the bottom of the tray, and the only thing that popped off was a straight razor. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. That it was is really cool. weird. I stood there and went, whoa, that's kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be walking around with a razor in that building. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I told it up. It's like, you know, the old-fashioned barber ones. And I don't let anybody else brand stuff when we were filming a show. So, you know, right. my house, my rules, my, my way. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And you, but, uh, you definitely run a very tight ship there. You you uh, you know exactly who's coming into your place. and. And uh, have all the paperwork on them and all that good stuff, which is good. That's good. I mean, that's a big building to. Uh, we have a question to, here. To um, have things well covered and secure. And yeah, Terry has a question for you. I have a question oh. from a listener, Maureen. She wants to know what's the weirdest thing a visitor has told you that they've seen there. The weirdest thing. Yeah, yeah, the, the weirdest experience. That somebody's told you that they've seen. Well, I don't know about I can't think of that right now, but I'll tell something where they happened this weekend on one of the okay. tours. Yeah, um, sure. my, volu- my volunteers are, are doing the tours um, because we're doing back-to-back tours and we're doing 40 people at a time it's for Halloween. And so we split the group of the 220 um, people tours and then they circle in different directions. And then after the tour, they'll go off on their own. So it's not like they're stuck in a group or anything. But um, one of the volunteers with Turner Backup were, were downstairs, and they were going kind of by Raymond's room to go down the tunnel. And this one woman, the minute she left, like, left the psych ward, one of the attendees, said, oh, my God, what's that foul smell? Oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sick. And I was saying, there's no smell. What are you talking about? Like, literally 19 other people, well, 21 if you want to come from my, my two volunteers, didn't smell a thing, nothing. And this one was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be sick. And she was, like, taking her sweatshirt and covering up her nose and everything else, and she literally thought she was going to hurl. And so somebody started taking pictures, oh. and right <clears throat> beside her is, a, is like, a shadow. And it's, not, it's a white, milky shadow, but you can see their arm, their body. You can see part of their head standing wow. like, right beside her and looming over her. Like, she was taller than her, and it it was making her completely nauseous. I have a wow. on my phone. It's just sitting in the back of her camera. I'm trying to post it on the Facebook page a little bit. It's really weird. Wow. wow. That's pretty cool. That's a good one. That is awesome. And, like, we nobody actually... else smelled it. And there was nothing there to smell. My building doesn't really, I mean, it has natural smells. Like, it smells like a heater somewhere or, you know, it might smell like bandages or stuff like, you know, your normal smells. <laughs> Which sounds really weird in and of itself. <laughs> but it has... So normal to me, um, but yeah, I mean, like to have something that smells. There's nothing in it that smells foul. It's a clean building. I mean, literally, an old building is a clean building. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Did you have a question? No. I'm doing oh, okay. We are actually going to go to a commercial, which just so happens to be the Rolling Hills commercial. So um, <laughs> if you're gonna, <laughs> if you can want to. Just uh, uh, stand by with us, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go right to the commercial break, and um, and we'll come back talking with Sharon. Rolling Hills Asylum. Located in East Bethany, New York, just minutes between two major airports, 
Rolling Hills Asylum is a hotbed of paranormal activity. They have been featured on travel channels, ghost adventures, paranormal challenge, as well as sci-fi channels, ghost hunters. Rolling Hills Asylum has been named the number two most haunted location in the United States by hauntednorthamerica.com. The property was established on January 1st, 1827 as the County Poor Farm. Throughout the years, it has operated as a poor farm, infirmary, orphanage, tuberculosis hospital, nursing home, and more. Past residents and inmates consist of widows, orphans, physically disabled, mentally unstable, murderers, and more. Over 1,700 bodies are buried in unmarked graves, and hundreds more deaths went undocumented. Rolling Hills Asylum is known for a plethora of phenomena, including disembodied voices, doors slamming, footsteps, sounds of furniture moving, full-body apparitions, shadow people, ghostly touches, and numerous Class A EVP. Rolling Hills Asylum proudly offers historical and flashlight tours, four- and eight-hour public ghost hunts, eight- and nine-hour private ghost hunts, and more by appointment or pre-booking only. For more information, please visit www.rollinghillsasylum.com. That's www.rollinghillsasylum.com. Or give them a call, 585-502-4066. That's 585-502-4066. Rolling Hills Asylum. What are you doing this weekend? Hi, everybody. We are back here back. with Sharon Quill Farley <laughs> from uh, Rolling Hills Asylum. She is the owner, and we are having a great time. We're getting to know a, a little more about Rolling Hills, which is awesome. If you have a chance to get there, listeners, you guys need to go there. Absolutely. This place is sick. It is. It's definitely quite an experience. And, you know, a lot of our paranormal friends, you know, they've gone there and absolutely love it there. And they always have great experiences that they share with us. Um, and it's definitely a, a huge place that you could actually bring. A, Massive group. Yeah. I mean, like, we have eight people on our team, and it seems like very tiny compared to what would be needed in that place. And um, I know me and you have gone there, and I can't wait to get the rest of our team in there. Oh, yeah. I want to go so bad. <laughs> I know. Ready. I have no idea. <laughs> we need to do that. We really do. <laughs> now, Sharon, I know you have um, uh, special promotions of, uh, of getting groups in there. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, what you, you have to offer, if Groups are, are um, interested in going. Want to go there? Yeah. Well, I mean, we do a lot of public stuff, and then of course, if, you know, usually the the more seasoned investigator is want to book a private hunt, and for the private consists of me obviously shutting down the building for just their group. Um, it's maximum ten people, but you can have as you know as few as one or two, but it's the same price because you're paying for the exclusivity of using the building yourself. I'm always in there with at least one volunteer, um, but it's really, you can do an eight-hour hunt during midweek, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and it's six seventy-five plus tax, so it's really nominal, and then on a Friday or Saturday, it's nine hours, and it's 1050 plus tax. So, um, is there a maximum number of people mm -hmm. that you could have for your group for that amount? Yeah, the max, the max is 10. Oh, okay. I thought maybe that it was, you know, you can have up to ten for the thousand fifty. Um, right. So that, that, yeah, that's thousand. That's exactly it. Max is ten for thousand. Okay. Now, if people want to, if they wanted to add more people to that group, is there a, a cost on top of that? Yeah, we usually prorate it. So okay. for a head count. So. Gotcha. And um, do you not do them on Sunday? Because you didn't mention Sunday. Um, they, they can be available on Sunday. Um, I was offering them during the summer like that. Right now, November's, um, November's pretty much booked already. And I kind of mix things up on Sunday. So it's really catches as catch can. Um, if there's 
you know, if I've got something on the calendar that isn't booked and you want to do that as a quarantine, I'd certainly switch stuff. Um, I can do that quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Now, just for the listeners out there, we only want you, we want you to make sure that you're definitely respectful of this place, of the spirits inside of Sharon's rules. Um, you know, I, I mean, all our friends, I know you will be, but I just wanted a blanket statement out there because this place is definitely a gem and something to be savored, and uh, we just we want the the people to have the respect of this place. So, um, is there a number or a way they can get a hold of you, Sharon? Well, the website's always good. It's, you know, www.rollinghillsasylum.com. Um, email info at rollinghillsasylum.com. There's a site number that you can leave a voicemail. It's 585-502-4066. Or you can hit me up on Facebook. I've got the official Rolling Hills Asylum Facebook page. Um, I just want to say one thing. I mean, my rules aren't over the top. I mean, it may seem like a lot when you're reading them, but when you stop and think about it, they're really just common sense stuff. But Absolutely. after four years of being here, every time somebody does something that's really like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to write that one down now. So the rules have kind of grown. We kind of assume that people use their common sense, but unfortunately the few that don't require the list to grow longer so it's in black and white and nobody has any discrepancies. But honestly, if you read it, 95% of the stuff is common sense. It's not anything over the top. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think um, probably the point that Steve's making is you've worked hard at at, um, keeping this building alive and going and accessible to teams and groups and people. And, um, you know, I know that you know, like you said, some sometimes every once in a while somebody does something crazy and you gotta add something to that list. And um it's just a matter of respecting your property and and uh the things inside of it and and that's important. That's yeah. important to us. You definitely group. got your notable teams out there that would definitely respect places, but then you have some of the people that are just in it for the thrill and you know, it's unfortunate but some of those people ruin it for some of the people that are serious and and trying to help people and trying to get in and actually respect and, and see what's going on in this field. Absolutely. Um, and that's, that's just what well, I was putting a blanket statement out there for. Well, you know what's really unfortunate is that, you know, that a lot of the locations like, you know, Penhurst and Waverly Hills, they've gotten so where you, they have people, they you can only go out on private investigations when you have one of their in-house or a couple of their in-house people shadow you and lead you around the property. And it's gotten like that because of the teams that don't respect location. And right. it's getting to the point where if, you know, I'm trying not to do that because I've been an investigator. I don't want to. And it's not that I, I'm going to do anything that I don't want them to see. But, you know, you don't feel like you want to have a babysitter. You just don't. And you're an adult. The problem is you treat people like an adult and they disappoint you. And when you yep. get to get so many disappointments, then those rules are going to change. I'm trying not to have to do that. I mean, you know, do we have a presence on the floor? And do we check, you know, walk around these five steps? Absolutely we do. Do we have to stay with you 100% of the time? No. But if we do something and it gets to be a problem, yeah, we will. And I don't want to have to do that. I think it's unfair to everybody. Um, You know, we're all adults. We should act as adults. And it shouldn't have to be a situation where we have to worry that people are going to be doing something stupid and being disrespectful. I mean, for me, this is my home. I live here. Whether I live in the building or I live on the property, the whole thing is my home. I consider it my home. I'd rather be in the building than in my house of duct tape that I live in. I'd rather be in the building. Um, and I feel more comfortable in the building to be truthful with you, but there's no heat or plumbing, so I'm kind of screwed. <laughs> so I have to be the plumbing underneath. But, you know, so people don't realize it is truly my home, and I do take personal offense if, you know, they do something that is, you know, disrespectful. It's, it's a personal slap in my face. It really truly really is. Because I would never go to someone's house and do some of the things that people have done to me. Never in a million years. And that's what you it know, is. It's, it's respect for the people's home. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't imagine the heating bill for that place. <laughs> well, there's no way. I mean, there's no way. Um, they did get an accommodation back in the 40s from the, from the state. Um, to keep me at one of the warmest um, infirmaries, one of the warmest facilities in the county. 
and I think it was something like 40, I want to say like 42 or 47 degrees in the winter was the warmest they could keep it, and they thought that was wonderful. Really? Wow. wow. Brick and cinder block and cement and sand plaster is built as the first fireplace facility of the county, so there's no insulation in it. How do you heat brick and cinder block? You don't. Yeah. You can't. You know, it's just impossible. It's like being in a basement 24-7. Right. Yeah. Now, do you close up during some of the months? Hell no. Over the winter? No? (laughs) A bag will put my mortgage on hold for four months while the weather turns, so, you know, I have to be open. Nice. I think I'll be there in January there for my birthday. Oh, there you go. (laughs) You dress, you dress really warm. You dress, you wear it's like you're gonna go out snowmobiling. And then we have one room that we call it the warm room, which is probably equivalent to when they were keeping up the warmest facility in the county. Um, <laughs> you know, we keep it up. You know, it depends on the outside temperature, obviously. But you know, we try to keep it um, between 40 and 50 degrees. It sounds cold, but when you're out in a building that's 20 degrees, um, it's not that bad. It's kind of and warm. keep the hot chocolate it's from cold. freezing, right? <laughs> yeah, you have hot coffee and, you know, you know, mm-hmm. so a microwave, you, know, you know, I buy individual microwavable soups, you know, and you can heat them up and have a hot cold chicken noodle soup or something. And, you know, <laughs> it's good. You go out for 45 minutes and you come back in or an hour and you come back in, you warm up, you go back out. It's not so bad. It really isn't. You get used to it um, as much as you, especially if you're out there investing. It's worse for me because I'm sitting there on the couch for eight hours while you guys are in the building. You know, I might walk around like I said and do spot checks, but overall, I'm, I'm wrapped up in a blanket sitting on the couch freezing while you guys are moving around having a good old time. <laughs> See, so, so you won't be able to do that when we come back because you'll have to go out with us. Absolutely. Yeah. That, no, that'd be fun. Thank you. Yeah, just if nothing else, I know it's from blue in the face. I know when me and Naomi were there, we were, you know, we were doing the four different groups and stuff. We couldn't wait to get out on our own. And, um, uh, we, as soon as they said, yep, that was it, you guys are free to go, everybody was standing around talking, me and Naomi tried to find the morgue, and you actually helped us find it the quickest we could get there. So. Let's go. Yeah, we're like, morgue time. It's, it's, it's so funny, because I can literally, and I kind of walk around the building, and, you know, without a flashlight, and the pitch black, and people were, like, freaking out, you know, or I'll forget to grab one to bring people down to the bathroom, and they're behind me, and they're like, so is that I'm like, oh, gee, I forgot the light, you know? <laughs> Like I forget I need it for you guys. Sorry. So, kind of funny. So, um, as you know, you've been um, well. Your building has been made the second most haunted place in the United States and the fourth in the world. Now, how do you know how that's determined, or or what the guidelines are, or? Um, I honestly yeah, don't. I honestly don't. I was just happy to get the title on it, so I don't. I didn't really ask. Honestly, I should, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I do know that the number one location is Gettysburg, and I have, yeah. I've not had the pleasure of going down there at all. Um, I hope I can make it down there. I mean, I'd love to just see it in any, any respect. Um, but, I, I mean, I would imagine a lot of it is residual, where Rolling Hills is really intelligent haunting, mm-hmm. more so than residual. I mean, I would say 90% of it is, is intelligent haunting. I'll give you, oh, that time tell you one funny thing? Sure. Yeah. Okay, one of my one of my volunteers was right over her mother for her birthday, and they were sitting in the classroom, and they had you know equipment out, flashlights, and recorders, and so forth. And the volunteer, my friend Katie, had sat down in the chair at the desk, at the teacher's desk, and her mother was sitting in the classroom desk, and they were quizzing each other. So Katie started to see her mom and asked, um, the question was, who is Booker T. Washington? And the mother goes, oh, isn't he like an educator? Uh, no, I'm sorry, peanut farmer? And the answer was, no, he's an educator. And they got an EDP right when she got the answer wrong, saying, what an idiot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that is... they're kind of harsh. They're, they must be a Scorpio like me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> so, but that, I mean, that, you, that's not... A residual haunt, I mean, which is kind of cool. It's like, you know, if they're, you know, yeah, it was kind of insulting, but, you know, I mean, they're right there with you. They're they're listening to what you're doing, and they're they're commenting on it, and they're participating in, in the conversation. And it's awesome. I love that part of it. That's awesome. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> yeah, I know when we when no, right before we saw <laughs> right before we saw the uh, the shadow up uh, down at that atrium area down the oh. long hallway, we were actually um, the reason why we had turned around is we had actually heard um, a, a ghost box session going on with three individuals, and the response or the question was, can you say this person's name three times? And the spirit box actually said it three times. Um, oh, yeah. Which I, was, which I was amazed. And the person said, can you say this name again three times? And it said the name twice, and then it says again, and then it said the name. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. wow. <laughs> I'm like, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. I mean, there that was probably George Lopez. And George and I do a lot of the dual spirit box. Um, Frank Fox sessions on his show a lot, and he's got he's got a really good technique, and I've learned a lot by working with him on Spirit Fox um, and Frank Fox, and it is really amazing that that we get so many um, responses and repetitive responses when we ask them to, and we'll do test questions or test responses like, you know, instead of just saying, oh, uh, are you here? Can you tell me your name? We'll say. We'll establish contact and we'll say something like, say the pumpkin is purple three times. If they say the pumpkin is purple three times, it is not a radio station. I'm sorry. Right. You know? <laughs> so, and, you know, even saying a name, like, you know, hi, John, hi, John, hi, John. John could be a DJ, you know, it could be anything. But right. if you say something obscure, you know, like the pumpkin is purple or, you know, whatever you want to say that's kind of odd, um, then you know you're communicating with an intelligence. Well, that's that's exactly who this was that I was talking about, and the name he yeah. said, "Can you say Bob Christopher three times?" And it said Bob Christopher three times. I I, I was just yeah. I've never heard that that right on in my life, and I just yeah. I, I had to stop and listen because I was like I can't believe I'm actually hearing what I'm hearing, you know. It's pretty yeah. amazing. It really truly really is. I mean, uh, unfortunately for me, and I, again, I was just having this conversation with uh, uh, someone else earlier today is that, you know, people think I have it made. I can investigate whenever I want and blah, blah, blah. In theory, in theory, yes, I could, but I don't because I'm so, you know, I do everything. People don't realize I do all the website, all the sales, all the marketing. I build all the ads for all the marketing. I do, except in October when I have help uh, because we do so many tours, I normally do every single tour. I'm in the building every single night until the last, you know, last person leaves. You know, I'm handling getting volunteers out here to do the work on it. I mean, I do everything. I literally, on good days, I get six hours sleep. On bad days, I get three to four hours sleep. Wow. And life is 24-7. In two years, I've only put 11,000 miles on my vehicle. In two years. Wow. Go I go to Batavia to get groceries or buy dog food or that's it. I don't, I don't have a life. My life is this place. And, unfortunately, all that other work, doesn't allow me to investigate because even if I did, I don't have time to review anything. So it's kind of definitely. Yeah, you, know, you are definitely a busy girl. Mm. Very so, busy girl. And it's not a complaint. It's just it's kind of sad for me because I really did. I really was, you know, a very serious investigator when I first got into this whole field, and I still think I'm a, a serious investigator. I just don't have a chance to to do it on my own, which is so frustrating for me. Now, did you belong to a team before, or do you belong to a team now? Um, I had my own team in California. I had a private group of three, Journey Paranormal Society, and then I had a public meetup group um, for the paranormal called Start the Journey. And we were the largest um, public paranormal meetup group from San Diego, San Diego to San Francisco to West Vegas. I had over 250 members. Wow. Uh, we, at the time, it was the biggest one. So um, the only one bigger was in San Diego. That's huge. Wow. That's crazy. Well, Sharon, we are actually running out of time, but I am so glad that you were able to join us. Um, I can't I, wait to see you get you get you again and your spirits again and oh, Rolling yeah. Hills. I am just excited to get back. So. We're def- I want to go. Yeah, we're definitely we're gonna we're gonna pack up all our teammates and we're gonna and come our full belly clams. Yeah, and that's the full oh, belly yeah. clams on ice. Now, do you want those Very fried good. or you don't want them not fried yet? Oh no, fry them please. They're fine. Fry them please. Fried fried fried. Fried. I eat them cold. I eat them hot. I'll eat them in my grave. I'm like fried it's like clams. it's like me with bubble, bubble gum shrimp, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Awesome. Just to our listeners, thanks for listening today. Uh, we we definitely couldn't do this without you guys, and uh, you know, like we said, we're excited that uh, Sharon, you got to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank and you so much for having me on. You're welcome, and we hope your your holiday season is uh, exciting and rewarding. As I'm sure you are crazy out of your mind busy as you know we are as investigators, um, just the season. Um, oh, and uh, also a very big One, two, happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Where did the rest of you go? <laughs> Thank you. That, you are the first one. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little early, just a little, little early. <laughs> so uh, our, to our listeners, make sure you look up um, her website at www.rollinghills.com, correct? Asylum.com. Yeah. Rolling Hills, Asylum.com. Rolling Hills, Asylum.com. And uh, they loaded with a lot of great information, um, definitely contact information, special events. Um, there's Halloween events going on right now as well. I believe you have going on. Um, I think there was like a shut-in thing going on. It's actually Correct? called a three-hour psych hold. A three-hour oh, psych hold for thirty dollars. We give you a tour, and then you wander around the rest of the time on your own. And they're unbelievably honest to God. I never thought it would take off. Hugely popular. We're selling out all the time, which is really great because our roofs are fixed before winter. The flat roofs. And people are coming back multiple, multiple times. Um, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm, I'm literally dumbfounded. I don't even know what to say. I'm, like, thrilled beyond belief um, because there's a couple of big big problems that we have, and we're going to have to be fixed for the next couple of weeks. So very well, grateful for that. It's definitely an exciting place that people want to go back to over and over again. Yeah. So, so yeah, definitely make sure you guys check out her website, go down, well, down, up, or wherever you are. To the side. Um, <laughs> uh, or over the waters, because I believe we have some friends from UK, UK listening, listening to that, yep. um, as right. well. Yeah. And uh, just make sure you guys check it out. It's definitely a great place to go to, filled with a lot of wonderful spirits loved by Sharon. And, and when uh, you get there, you're going to have to check out the museum that she's talking about or that she talked about earlier today. Yeah. Packed with a lot of interesting things that I don't want to give the hints to. So. Oh yeah, some definitely very interesting things. You have in to there. see it when you get there. Yeah, and definitely have some time Thank to you. talk to Sharon because she's filled with a lot of great information about the place. Now next week we have Edwin Gonzalez, which is the owner of the haunted, haunted Victorian. Victorian mansion. And Gardner Map, which we had the pleasure of going there. Beautiful place inside. Recently was just on Ghost Adventures yes. and um, has also been on Ghost Hunters and I believe a couple more other places. Um, Edwin is filled with great stories. Um, we could sit and talk with him for hours and hours. And uh, we definitely loved being there as well. So make sure you join us for that episode next week, 8 o'clock. Um, and then, of course, we have our Halloween special coming up as well, which is little secrets of who's coming. Should be really exciting. <laughs> Excuse me, is Edward next week or next week, week after? Next, next week. week. So we are doing one next week. Yep. Okay. Yep. Live next week. Yep. Live next week. Already. Live. So, from all of us here at Into the Unknown Realm, we hope you all have a wonderful week. And hey, thank you for listening. <laughs> and and thank you, Sharon, for joining thank us. You. We had a blast with thank you. you. We'll buy you a ticket so you can hunt with us. <laughs> <laughs> have so a funny. great night, Sharon. <laughs> Thanks, you too, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. You're Bye. all welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Rolling Hills Asylum.
Located in East Bethany, New York, just minutes between two major airports, Rolling Hills Asylum is a hotbed of paranormal activity. They have been featured on travel channels, Ghost Adventures, Paranormal Challenge, as well as Sci-Fi Channel's Ghost Hunters. Rolling Hills Asylum has been named the number two most haunted location in the United States by HauntedNorthAmerica.com. The property was established on January 1st, 1827 as the County Poor Farm. Throughout the years, it has operated as a poor farm, infirmary, orphanage, tuberculosis hospital, nursing home, and more. Past residents and inmates consist of widows, orphans, physically disabled, mentally unstable, murderers, and more. Over 1,700 bodies are buried in unmarked graves, and hundreds more deaths went undocumented. Rolling Hills Asylum is known for a plethora of phenomena, including disembodied voices, doors slamming, footsteps, sounds of furniture moving, full-body apparitions, shadow people, ghostly touches, and numerous Class A EVP. Rolling Hills Asylum proudly offers historical and flashlight tours, four- and eight-hour public ghost hunts, eight- and nine-hour private ghost hunts, and more by appointment or pre-booking only. For more information, please visit www.rollinghillsasylum.com. That's www.rollinghillsasylum.com. Or give them a call, 585-502-4066. That's 585-502-4066. Rolling Hills Asylum. What are you doing this weekend?